Hi, and welcome to The Curling Show, the podcast that brings you interviews with the sport's top athletes and the people who shape the game. I'm Dean Gemmel, and in this edition, we talked with Dave Parks, Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Curling Association. Well, hi, Dave, and welcome to the show. I appreciate your time and your willingness to be a part of a podcast that's never short of opinions about the sport we all love. Well, my pleasure, Dean. Glad to participate. Hey, let's start with the most recent news, news that I think pleased most curling fans in Canada, a TV deal with TSN for coverage starting in 2008 and running through 2014. It's no secret for at least the last couple of years, your seat has been more than a little warm, and a lot of that dissatisfaction has been centered around TV coverage. It's gone from all CBC to the old CBC-TSN combo, now to all TSN. What makes this latest deal the right one? Well, there's a number of things, I guess, uh, that I that I should start by by saying that we're excited about the new deal as well. TSN's always been a great partner. CBC has been a great partner as well uh, over the years. But clearly, the last couple of years have shown that um, you know, with the two two telecasters uh, going in different directions, uh, that the ability or the willingness to to work together was was pretty frail, <laughs> and. Um, you know, there was a there was a point at about two and a half years ago, I suppose, where where we were presented with the opportunity to make a decision about the the sports future on television. And uh, when we went out, we were looking really to to renegotiate status quo, and and found out pretty quickly from from the, the from the uh, people that we were talking to that status quo wasn't going to be an option for us. So we were we were put into a position where basically. We were looking then for a one broadcaster situation. Um, uh, clearly, that didn't work out the way I think everyone had hoped it might, uh, and the curling fans were probably correct in in expressing their concern the way they did. Uh, CCA wasn't happy with that situation either, as as the contract unfolded. But that that's all history now. Um, you know, we're we're satisfied with the fix that we've negotiated, uh, which sees a version of the previous status quo back in place, where it's CBC on final weekends, TSN doing round robin, and extremely satisfied with the future of, of telecast for the sport because it's, it provides predictability, it provides uh, uh, an increased level of coverage, we'll see a return to morning draws, we'll see uh, increased coverage at the Canada Cup, uh, we'll see a return to previous levels of coverage for the Continental Cup, and um, you know we've got we've got solid, predictable future for television for the next six years, which makes the uh, marketing of our sport something that uh, uh, you know people can look forward to. We can we can be out there in the marketplace saying we will be on air, we will be uh, two and forty hours in. Uh, on air in in Olympic years, and we'll be in uh, in somewhere in the vicinity of 218 in non-Olympic years, and and we can be out selling to corporate Canada on that strength. So, is part of the reason you you didn't go back to CBC and, and ask them about a better deal than maybe you got from TSN? Is part of that reason just the shift in focus at CBC Sports? Um, there's a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, I mean, you know, CBC uh, has shown that they weren't able to offer. A single broadcaster option to us. Um, Country Canada clearly was not an option. CRTC made that made that uh, point for them. And and the other the other situation is clearly that CTV Specialty, CTV and TSN are are now Canada's Olympic broadcasters. And um, we believe that our sport deserves to have the kind of profile that that being on the Olympic network provides. And uh, we thought it was important that we become one of TSN's primary, if not cornerstone, amateur sport properties heading into that time frame. With your TV deals, why is there no definitive dollar amount attached like we see with other sports when, say, the NHL bids rights and they say, well, we've got X amount of million from a broadcaster? Why are the curling coverage deals a little more complicated? Well, uh, we don't get money for television. Television costs us money. Uh, so that's I guess that's one of the first misnomers that's out there. Uh, you know, lots of people think that we get rights. Uh, you know, we get money for our television. That's not the case. Um, uh, very few sport properties actually get money from television to be on television. Uh, most sport that you see on TV is paying for that opportunity. Our 
our packaging of our business uh, is a little bit different and perhaps a little bit more complicated than others because we have taken the position that we will market our properties in-house. So when we go to a television carrier, we we are looking for um, a package of sponsorship rights and a package of commercial inventory that we then go out and sell to the marketplace. So you go out and sell the ad time yourself, which I which I understood was true, but I just wanted to clear that up. What's the biggest pushback you get, say, from networks or prospective advertisers about curling? I mean, curling on, on TV in Canada, if you look at the numbers, is a pretty attractive media property, but why do the networks, uh, I guess my question is, why aren't they hungrier for it? Well, curling's always been a tough sell, actually, uh, oddly enough. <laughs> uh, numbers are, have always been great, uh, but when... When the sport, going back a number of years, when the sport was trying to basically sell its properties on a one-off basis, uh, you know, going to try and find a title sponsor for an event, uh, it was it was very very tough. They don't like the demographics of the audience. Is that what they usually counter with? De- well, demographics are obviously huge to sponsors. I, you know, they're looking. This isn't a donation from a sponsor. It's it's an investment, and they're looking for re- return on investment. So, yeah, demographics are hugely important to sponsors, and uh, our demographic is generally 25, 54, um, and therefore you're out in the marketplace trying to find companies who are interested in that marketplace. Our demographic also skews a little bit uh, heavier toward males, so that means that you're generally out in the marketplace looking for sponsors who are skewing toward male in 2554 range. So, you know, there's lots of companies out there, but not all of them are going to be looking for our demographic. The other the other thing that we do have, though, going in our favor is that we have all sorts of research that says that curlers are incredibly loyal in terms of support of sponsors. So, you know, we can, we can support our um, our sponsorship sales efforts by suggesting to sponsors that uh, sponsors who are involved in our sport get rewarded by virtue of of uh, fans generally choosing to choose their products. Why such a long term deal with TSN? It, you know, it's hard to figure out how people will consume media in two years, let alone in 2014. I'm a little worried that parts of this package could be out of date by the time 2008 rolls around. Well, the, the length of the deal, I think, is something that we are extremely excited about, uh, conversely, uh, to, to the opinion that you just gave. You know, we think that uh, we wanted to be in a situation where we can take advantage of 2010. Uh, again, going back to the marketplace, we can, be, we can be back in the marketplace renewing or acquiring uh, sponsors on the strength of hopefully a strong showing in 2010, again, with predictable television. Um, secondly, with respect to the to the new platforms or the the multimedia platforms that are in the deal, I think everybody believes that there's going to be lots of potential for those to be valuable. At sure. this point, they aren't. And um, you know, we we've had those discussions with with TSN during these negotiations, and and clearly part of their Olympic mandate is to develop those those platforms. So they're, you know, they're in a tremendous position to develop those platforms with our sport. And by the time 2014 rolls around or 2012, uh, when you're back in the marketplace trying to find a new television deal, um, those platforms will all hopefully have developed a value that's tangible. And then we can be out there trying to market that tangible value as opposed to having to cultivate it ourselves. So the real value is stability and, 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 manage, and being able to be a part of those platforms for sure. Absolutely, and having someone else invest in their development. Uh, you know, we don't have the money at this point to invest in the development of those platforms, uh, and having a partner who is prepared to invest in the development of the platforms makes good sense. Hey, what about the 300000 or the 500000 or whatever it was that the CBC claims the CCA owed it? Uh, where does that stand? Uh, that stands in abeyance at this point, basically. Um, you know, we continued, uh, we we agreed to disagree, I, I suppose, is the best term that I could use. Um, when we renegotiated the deal uh, for the remaining three years of the, new, the original four-year contract, uh, basically we agreed to disagree on, on that $300,000. And um, uh, that's, 
that's going to be determined at some point, perhaps, by an arbitrator. That was the uh, the way that was settled. It was just basically taken off the table and put a, put aside uh, to be dealt with at some point down the road. Beyond the TV deals, I, you know, I had George Carey of the Curling News on the show a while ago, and his opinion was that, that what your organization lacked was a real communications plan. And there have been some public relations miscues, whether it was you know finding Colin Jones' team at the at the Scotties Tournament of Hearts, Canadian senior teams having their travel money cut in half. Uh, there have been a number of miscues, I think, over the over the past couple of years, and and I think as early as the late '80s with uh, Ed Wernick and the Olympic trials qualifying process. Why do you think this organization seems to shoot itself in the foot? Well, you used some interesting examples there, actually. Um, you know, all of which perhaps we could talk about. But uh, we we are an organization that does an awful lot of things very, very, very well. You know, we take on a mandate that's much, much broader than most national sport governing bodies do, and um, we have staff that are stretched to the limit in terms of doing that. We, we'd love to have a communications person on staff, uh, and George and I have actually talked about that. You know, there's there's all sorts of valid reasons for uh, for having someone who focuses in on uh, presenting the best image for any organization, whether they be an amateur sport body or any business. Uh, we don't have that. Uh, what we tend to do is reinvest all money that we generate back into the development of the sport, and we haven't at this point prioritized the uh, the importance of a communications person. So uh, do we do we slip every once in a while? Absolutely, we do. Uh, you know, uh, but I think generally, overall, if someone were to take a, if anyone were to take a look at at the broad-based efforts of the organization and where the organization and the sport has grown over the past 15 years. Um, we do a lot of things very, very well and do far more things well than we than we do not very well. well. How do you think some of those little things happen, though? Like the finding of the Colleen Jones team, I think, astounded a lot of people. And it just, you know, it wasn't really a communications thing, but it didn't make much sense. Well, uh, you know, there's a there's a couple of those things, and and uh, you know, those are process things. Uh, we had we had a new uh, a new fine process in place that that some of our people perhaps didn't follow appropriate process uh, on. So, uh, could we have done that better? Probably. Um, do we do that better now? Yeah, I think we do. And uh, will we continue to get better at that? Sure. Um, you know, and, and we also tend to be an organization, uh, as I think most similar organizations to us tend to be. Uh, we tend to be an organization that uh, doesn't use the media uh, to uh, to communicate. We would rather communicate directly. We would rather we would rather uh, deal with with issues, um, you know, quietly as opposed to vote in the public forum. Uh, the CBC situation, uh, you know, is another example of that kind of scenario where, where, you know, we took a bashing for a couple of years, and, and we took a bashing knowing that a lot of the things that were being said were not quite true. Uh, some of them were actually wrong, but, you know, because of contract confidentiality clauses, we're not permitted to, to be out in the public Defending ourselves or actions of the board, uh, so I, you know it's it's a bit of a bit of an interesting environment that we live in as a as an amateur not for profit that tries to play in the in the corporate world and does relatively well at it. But uh, you know the, the misconceptions uh, of of uh, of our organization in terms of how well we do and and uh, what we do. Uh, is certainly an area that a communications person could help us with. There's no doubt about that. You know, I mean, I understand your point about confidentiality, but, I, you know, I have a feeling that silence breeds paranoia. So when you when you don't hear things from an organization, it creates more rumors. I think one place that you guys could easily be on, I mean, if you look at the curlingzone.com forums, uh, when conversations there take off, uh, I think it'd be great if someone from the CCA was authorized to get in there and, and, and put out your point of view. Uh, sure, and that would be a good thing for a communications person to do, maybe. But uh, you know, at this point, nobody in this organization has the time to to monitor uh, chat rooms on in the internet and and respond. Um, it's just it wouldn't be practical, Dean. Uh, you know, as nice as it would be, uh, because clearly, you know, there's an awful lot of people with with opinions on what we do or don't do in this country, 
and uh, it would be lovely to get to get our perspective out there, but we just clearly don't have the time or the resources to do that. Yeah, it's been interesting, though. I mean, Dave Nettowin gets on there and actually has, has solved a lot of conversations with questions about whether it was Curl TV or something with his team. It doesn't take a lot of time, but anyways. We could look at your budget and say that 74% of the money goes toward the elite curlers. Now, I'm a big supporter of the elite curler, but do you think 74% of your budget going towards the elite curler is right or the right balance for an organization that's supposed to be growing the game at the grassroots level? Well, again, that, that takes us back to the situation where, you know, we assume more of a expanded mandate than most NSOs. Most NSOs um, wouldn't spend the kind of money or resources that we do at the grassroots level. We're, we're proud of what we do there. Uh, whether it be through contributing financially or whether it be through providing resources. You know, the Business of Curling program is a tremendous example, I think. The Learn to Curl program is a tremendous example. We we do an awful lot of good work at the the community level. And And, and those are good programs. Yeah, so, you know, I I, I think it's it's not always just money. Um, You know, the fact that we provide development grants uh, to facilities, you know there are loans available to facilities. There's there's a number of things that we do that do include dollars and cents, but there's a number of things that we do and uh, which are having huge impacts, uh, positive impacts that are based more on provision of resources and services than finances. What about the future of the Canada Cup? You know the last one ran a deficit, I guess, of two hundred ten thousand. I know the Strauss Herb Company is a great sponsor, but does it make sense for the CCA to keep running a? an event that's losing money and it you know it looks to me an awful lot like a cash spiel that and, and maybe a sponsorship uh the Strauss sponsorship might be better served with the WCT um well <laughs> loaded question i know but i mean i know it's an olympic trials qualifying event that does provide some balance but it's built into our uh trials qualification process it's built into the continental cup it, you know it's it's become woven into our season of champions properties uh, can we afford to continue operating an event that loses money? No. Uh, will we have to be looking for ways to address the fact that it loses money? Absolutely, we will. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll be looking at ways of saving money. We'll be looking at ways of generating new money. We'll be looking at alternate sites, perhaps. You know, we just clearly can't afford to uh, to continue to lose money there. You know, you talk about uh, uh, losing money. You guys did have a deficit last year, and you're projecting another one this year. And I know you're scrutinizing every cost of the CCA, which you have to do. Uh, one thing that always sticks out for me is that extra end magazine I see in clubs. It seems like old media, and I, I, I wonder why you keep putting out a publication that's old news by the time people see it. Well, the extra end magazine is as much a sponsor tool as it is a communication tool. Um, the annual is is in effect that you know it's it's a recapsulation of of things that have already happened, um, but the extra end series of magazines is uh, also doubles as programs for us at all of our season of champions events. So there's there's two components to it. First of all, it provides a communications vehicle, albeit late, um, but it does also provide a fulfillment vehicle for sponsorships. Anything else you'd like to address before we move on to the run back? Uh, well, I, you know, there's there's all sorts of topics I think that we could talk about o- over time. But um, I'm just I'm glad you uh, gave me the opportunity to to be on the show. It's good. All right, we finish these uh, interviews with something we call the run back, where I give you a topic and you give me your thoughts on it in one to three words. <laughs> okay. And I'm pretty lax with one to three words. All right, here we go. CBC head of sports Nancy Lee. I think she's a wonderful person. Singles curling in the Olympics. Uh, it has potential to be a very exciting sport. Really? I'm not so big on the singles. I think it makes the game look a little silly. Now, do I get to use more words than three in that response? Yeah, you can. You see, that's because I just butted in with more than three. So you're welcome. to. I, I, think, it's a, I, think, it's, I think it's boring to watch, for one thing, and I don't think it, it serves the purpose of elevating the game as a, as a true sport. Well, there's two aspects to that. I think singles curling has probably more uh, more interesting application at the curling club level. Uh, you know, it, it's not hard to imagine it as as a comparison to the uh, old racquetball ladders or squash ladders that you used to see. You know, where people could come in and drop into the facility and spend 15 minutes throwing some some stones and challenging others in the club. I you know, I think it's got potential for uh, for a club application that's pretty exciting. Uh, in terms of in terms of the Olympics, you know we're 
we're having to deal with a couple of limiting factors there while still trying to search a discipline. Because uh, a second medal by virtue of a, of a new discipline would be very exciting for our sport, clearly. Uh, the two options for us are singles or mixed doubles. And, um, you know, while singles is on the plate of the IOC at this point, uh, I wouldn't rule mixed doubles out either. I like Well, I like the sounds of mixed doubles better, although I, I do think I've just learned something about the singles curling in a club in a ladder system. That is interesting. Curlingzone.com online forums. Um, gives people a chance to contribute their thoughts. Yeah, always, always a worthwhile time. Last year's Regina Briar. Exceptional. This year's Hamilton Briar. Uh, hopefully equally as exceptional. The Delivery Stick. A uh, great tool to keep people in the game. Okay. I'm glad you guys keep it out of national competitions, though, to be honest. I'm really paranoid down here in the United States about shuffleboard comparisons. <laughs> and a fun bond spiel you wish you could play in every year. Well, I used to go down to the Bemidji summer spiel. I don't even know if it still operates, but um, it was always fun. All right, Dave. Hey, I appreciate your time. Uh, enjoy the rest of your summer, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to good things next year. Thanks, Dean. That's Dave Parks on The Curling Show. Thanks for listening throughout the summer, and a special thanks to the city of Moncton, which, on a per capita basis, just may be our best market. Here's Black Pudding.